Well, the trench is obviously a bit of a, a bit of a shock if you've never done anything like that before. If you've not, if it's your first time into them, and it really depends on where in France or Belgium you go as to what they're going to be like. The period of the First World War in society was a lot more smelly than now, anyway, because of course they had a lot of animals in towns and cities, and animals were everywhere, particularly horses. But you've also got lots of blokes all jammed in together. So you have got, although they are very disciplined about their latrines, there's still going to be that permeating right the way through. Obviously, the smell of rotting flesh and uh, toilet buckets were a pretty significant feature of the front line, as well as lingering smells like cordite and lidite. Um, so a massive assault on the senses. There's, all going, there's also going to be chemical smells if there have been gas attacks, if there has been artillery firing, there's going to be cordite from rifles. So this real assault on your senses, particularly, I think, smell because obviously if you're stuck in the ground there's not a whole hell of a lot to see certainly there's a lot to smell the army's very careful about supplying food up to the front so they're, they're using a lot of the local produce and a lot of the lo local provender um, which means because it's france there's quite a lot of time if you're getting a big stew it might well be a big horse stew which is a bit of a surprise for a for an english guy but you know there you are if you're hungry you're going to eat it the cells affectionately call the tin stew dog vomit I don't know if it looked like dog vomit or tasted like dog vomit, I'm not sure. Um, corned beef often referred to as monkey or sage, but essentially tinned food that was opened, heated and served out in big, a um, big mess of stew, supplemented by biscuit or hard tack. The problem is most of the food would be um, prepared a few trenches back uh, and it's then carried forward in big metal cans called Dixies and therefore it can be a bit cold by the time it gets to you and if there's been a shell burst that's thrown a lot of material in the air you might find that's in your stew as well but you're gonna to have to make do the best you can. The drink was often tea because the water was purified using chloride of lime and it gives a very uh, tangy flavour to the water so the tea heavily sweetened helps disguise the water taste. The very first medical post is in the front line with you. That's your regimental aid post, and that's staffed by your own medical officer from your battalion. There are then a series of medical stations going back from the front line. So within about a kilometre, there's an advanced dressing station where they can do rudimentary surgery, then casualty clearing stations, and right back at the base, there are hospitals and recuperation centres. So the further you get from the front line, the larger the medical complexes get but they are right there in the front line with you. The medical care by the Royal Army Medical care Corps is excellent. And if you can get into the system, you've got a 75% chance of survival. Um, they've learned a lot from the previous war in South Africa. They've had to learn a lot more from the, the, the war that they've been engaged in in France. Some of the systems that they used in South Africa won't work in France because the Velt is sterile and Flanders is not. It is a time of enormous growth and change. Got to remember when we go into the First World War, Blood typing is new, blood transfusion is new, things like vascular surgery are new. So the conditions of the trenches meant that soldiers were suffering different types of injuries, a lot of head and upper body injuries, which forced people to invent new types of surgery. So plastic surgery is invented, um, and massive leaps forward made in medical care. They've got medical officers with each battalion, there are stretcher bearers and orderlies, very close to the front lines who can get casualties back to aid posts and then there's a chain of evacuation to get them back out again. So generally the medical care is excellent for, for British soldiers. And if they can't save you then you're lucky. If you're lucky you get morphine and a cigarette and um, maybe a cup of tea and they'll put you to one side because they can't risk losing people to save a few. So it, the kind of harsh reality of medicine there was that at times there were more people than there were resources. It's a volunteer army when the war starts and the problem is not, in 1914 the problem is not getting people to join, it's, it's they're getting too many um, because the, the volunteer wave in August of 1914 is colossal. People really want to join the army um, and they're having to be careful about the numbers that they're bringing in. The purpose of recruiting is to build a groundswell of support and the stories of violence against Belgium and the people of Belgium perhaps had their roots in reality. There are 
many stories that circulate at the period, but obviously the PR machine picks them up and hypes them because they're trying to get people to do what they want. If you're unemployed in 1914, joining the army is a good option because not only will you be paid, you'll also be fed and you'll be clothed. So people join up for all kinds of reasons. Peer pressure, obviously, is another thing. If all your mates are going and you're the only one not, then maybe you'll be looked on askance. So some people go for patriotism. Some people don't want to be called cowards. Some people want to look good to their girlfriend. There's all sorts of different triggers and pushes. The understanding of psychiatry isn't around in 1914. And the growth of psychiatry gives us an understanding of the working of the human mind. It's been long recognised that soldiers suffer from battle fatigue. I mean, the Romans identified that. So there is, a, an, uh, there is an understanding that stress can work on the soldier, but it's felt that showing that is a sign of weakness in the man. So a lot of people felt that soldiers should just be able to get over stress. It, it wasn't a permanent thing, it was a temporary thing that you might suffer in the heat of the moment. The idea of battlefield shock, neurasthenia, uh, shell shock, that sort of thing, develops during the First World War. Initially, we don't know what it is uh, and we're not prepared for it. So originally, shell shock is exactly that, the, the idea that a, a shell has burst close to you and the wave, of uh, the shock wave going through your body has in some way damaged your nerve endings and made you physically no longer capable of carrying on is initially what they think it might well be. But increasingly as the war goes on, medical officers are reporting that soldiers who have been buried in shell fire or who have been very close to shell fire don't recover from it in the same way that soldiers who have just been subjected to random shell fire. Um, and if a soldier has been sort of had a near miss two or three times, some medical officers think that was it, there was, there was a write-off. And I think part of the problem is, is with shell shock and the fact that it might have been uh, looked on as an excuse. Generally speaking, the, the soldiers that you serve with will know you because they've gone through training with you and they've served with you, they will know you. So they will know if you've reached the end of your line, if you've done everything that you can do and then you're physically no longer capable of working, they will know it, they will accept it and they'll try and get you out. If you're trying to work your passage, if you're perhaps not as ill as you're saying you are, they'll know that too. The military death penalty was abolished in 1930. So the strictures that the army has against its population now is much reduced and more in line with modern society. Um, of course, soldiers now are volunteers. So the ultimate sanction is losing your job, losing your place in the army. You might go to prison because the army still has its own prisons and its own justice system. But that ultimate sanction, though, isn't in place. The old saw is that those who, uh, who don't learn the lessons of history are, history are doomed to repeat them. Um, and that's, to a certain extent, I suppose that's true. But the fact is that these events happened in our past. They're part of the story of our, our country. And it's, I think it's very important that children, certainly, learn about what's happened in the past, learn about the sacrifices that have been made by people who joined the British Army and what they have done for this country. And that's really part of the, the reason that we have an education department at the National Army Museum. We here in Britain are very lucky because the fabric of our society is historical. The buildings we see, the structure of the fields, um, the titles that people have in the House of Commons, in the church. There's so much history inbuilt into our everyday lives that we're just not aware of very often. But if we don't understand history, we don't understand how our society is as it is, why it is as it is, what's shaped it, what's formed it. And it leads you to live your life just in the now, which is fine if that's what you want. But in many ways, we are increasingly the first generations who are ahistorical because our life has changed so much in the last 50 years in this country that it bears no resemblance to what's happened before. Um, as an exemplar, up in, up in the north, they didn't get electricity in many towns and communities until the 1950s. Farms don't get their first tractors until the 1950s. So life for them continued in a way untouched or unbroken as a tradition for hundreds of years. 
But for us now, what happens in our everyday life bears no resemblance to even the lives of our parents or our grandparents. If you look at the scroll of honour that was given to every family of a soldier who was killed in the First World War, the last bit of it says, let those who come after see to it that his name be not forgotten. Well, we're the people who come after. It's our job to make sure their names are not forgotten and that's why we've got a National Army Museum in the first place. I think understanding of history helps us understand the context of our lives. Now, a lot of young people, that won't be important because they are their own context. The world is quite small around them. But as they grow into adulthood, as their sphere broadens, unless they have that underpinning, they, they won't be able to make sense of the, the wider world.